Hello, in this lecture, I'll be covering the analysis of functional MRI or fMRI data. This is part one, overview and pre-processing. In MRI research, we spend some time acquiring the MRI data, and our goal eventually is to turn this into some publications and share our research findings. However, what most people who are new to the field often don't realize is that the majority of our time is actually spent analyzing the data and making sense of the results. So in this series of lectures, I'll go over everything that is involved in analyzing functional MRI data. In particular, one of our goals is to map the activation. That is, in this case, for example, the person was tapping the fingers on the left and right hands, and our goal was to determine in what brain areas do we see signal changes that matches the pattern of when we ask the participant to do the particular task, increasing when we ask them to do the task, and then decreasing when they weren't performing the task. And we can then plot these colored regions on top of a higher resolution structural image that was also acquired. The first step really is to look at your data. And I can't emphasize this enough. Here's a couple of examples of some things that might have gone wrong. Uh, on the left, uh, this was we were fortunately looking at these images while we were acquiring them. And this turned out to be an error in the image reconstruction. Uh, on the right, you can see that the image is quite distorted. And we realized we had to improve the shimming. The changes can be a little more subtle too. Uh, for example, here we're looking at the time courses from nine voxels within the brain. And you can notice in some of these voxels a big spike. So if you look at your data, uh, you can not just looking at the, the, the images, but also looking at the time courses uh, is very important just to get a feel for what problems there might be with the data. So once you've taken a look at the data, the next step is to perform a series of what we call pre-processing steps. That is, different steps that you have to do to correct for distortions or other kinds of errors before we actually get to trying to detect the activation. And we're now going to go into these in greater detail. The first is to skip the first few images. Now, why do we do that? Well, the first image that you acquire, typically no other image has been acquired for a period of time before that. However, in all the subsequent images, uh, the volume has been excited uh, at TR beforehand. And therefore, with the typical TRs that we're using for the imaging studies, about one or two seconds, uh, the magnetization has not fully recovered uh, compared to what was the case in the first image. As a result, we see brighter signal in the first few time points before we reach the steady state. So the solution is to simply ignore or remove those first few images. Now, the scanner can actually do that for you. Uh, you can actually prescribe some dummy acquisitions. However, I prefer actually to acquire this data and then you can remove it yourself because there's actually some interesting information one could make use of if one wanted to. The next step would be to uh, field map correction. This is to correct for the B0 field, the magnetic field distortions. So as you recall on the electron artifact, when you place an object into a magnetic field, the magnetic field gets distorted. So here's a simulation of what happens when you place a head into the MRI scanner. And you can notice some distortions, particularly around the orbital frontal cortex, which is due to the air tissue interface and the sinuses to the brain. Now, uh, these magnetic field changes cause the image to be distorted, as shown in these examples here. They can also cause signal loss, that is signal dropout due to the through plane uh, distortions in the magnetic field. Unfortunately, we can't do very much about the signal loss in post-processing. However, we can correct for the image distortions. Here's an example of a phantom with a plastic grid inside of it, uh, where we've applied some non-uniformity in the X direction. You can see that the image is distorted. However, if we acquire a separate field map, then we can use that field map to correct for these distortions, for example, using FSL's fugue. Another technique to correct for distortions is to use uh, what some people refer to as blip up, blip down, or the FSL program top up correction. And that is if you acquire the data with an echoplanar imaging sequence in scanning in one direction through K-space, uh, some parts of the image might be stretched. If you flip that around and scan the other way through K-space, those same parts will be squished together. And so by comparing the images with these reverse uh, phase encode directions, you can find out what parts of the brain have moved to do the field distortions, and you can create a map of the field that way. Another correction technique is what we call slice timing correction. And that is because the, uh, we're acquiring a volume of the brain, but we're not acquiring all the slices at the same time. They're usually spread out over the entire TR, which could be up to about two seconds. 
and we're trying to detect uh, brain activation changes. Uh, and so uh, we either have to modify how we're going to model the response, or we can interpolate our data so that uh, essentially we get an estimate of what uh, the signal would have been like at a, a particular point in time. Now, just a few uh, words of caution there. Uh, this interpolation fails when these signal changes are not sampled fast enough. So if you're interested in mapping cardiac fluctuations, uh, then if your TR is too long, uh, you shouldn't interpolate. Uh, so basically interpolation can make it more difficult to do physiological noise correction. Uh, another is that if for some reason you had a very long TR, let's say longer than four seconds, then you really shouldn't do slash timing correction because that would interfere with your ability to detect the bold response. Next, uh, we want to correct for head movement. Now, generally, we see the effects of head movement uh, most prominent at the edges, because this is where you see the biggest signal change. So for example, a voxel that was outside the brain is suddenly now inside the brain. And similarly, on the opposite side, a voxel that was inside the brain is now outside the brain. So a very characteristic uh, signature of motion artifacts is when you see you know, positive related signal changes on one side and negative related signal changes on the opposite side. Uh, these signal changes can be a little bit more subtle than what's shown here, so it's also useful to look at the time course of the signal. How do we correct for this movement? One step is image registration. So for example, let's say that the image of the brain has moved from one time point to the next. We have some uh, grid that we've acquired the data on. Uh, the image registration would be to pick one as the baseline uh, volume and then register those to that baseline volume. A couple, there's a few decisions we have to make. First, are we going to uh, just treat this as a rigid body, that is, a model only six parameters for this registration, or are we going to allow for some shearing and some uh, stretching that is a 12 parameter affine registration? Next, what metric are we going to use to estimate the motion? Are we going to use uh, intensities? Are we just going to look at the edges? Are we going to look at the least squares difference of intensities or some mutual information? What cost function are we going to use? And then finally, once we've determined what the movement was, how are we going to realign the images? That is, how are we going to interpolate the data? Next, we want to generally align the data. Uh, first of all, the functional data, which is acquired in echoplanar images, we want to align that to the structural data, uh, typically a T1-weighted higher resolution image. Uh, and we also want to register that higher resolution image, that structural image, to a template, uh, particularly if we want to do group studies and we want to compare the uh, activations uh, across a group of individuals. So typically we um, find the, align the EPI to the structural image, we align the structural image to the template space, and then it's best to concatenate these two transformations so that in the end we can do a single transformation from the EPI to the template space. An alternative would be to perform all of these steps on the final estimated activation amplitudes or statistical data sets. Now, why do we want to concatenate these two transformations? The reason for that has to do with the fact that every time you do an interpolation, you introduce some blurring in the data. So in this example, I've taken an original brain image that you see here on the left, and I've rotated this 36 times, each time resampling this data using different interpolation algorithms, either nearest neighbor, linear, cubic, and so on. And you can see that after 36 interpolations, uh, nearest neighbor is particularly bad. Uh, linear is also introduces quite a bit of blurring and the others a bit less so. But in general, the more times you interpolate it, the more blurring you add to the data. So if you want to reduce the amount of blurring in your data, it's best to concatenate all of these transformations and apply a single transformation at the end. Another step that's commonly done is spatially smoothing the data. Uh, this is typically done to reduce the noise and improve the signal to noise ratio. Uh, it also helps in terms of alignment uh, between individuals, just because uh, sometimes the alignment to template space is not perfect, or um, you know, that's, uh, the activations might be slightly different locations uh, in, across individuals. So if we're trying to detect uh, sort of on average where the activation is in the population, the smoothing does help in that case. Now, in general, uh, there's sort of what's called a matched filter theorem. That is, if you're looking for blobs of activation of a certain size, you're actually optimal to detect those uh, if you match the amount of smoothing to the size of the activation you're hoping to detect. Uh, the flip side is that any smaller activations than what you're blurring, you're going to be missing uh, those. So you're going to be smoothing that out and not be able to detect those as well. 
There are also cases where you perhaps might not want to perform smoothing. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to map things to a cortical surface, you might want to do that first and then smooth things on the cortical surface. Or if you want to do some fancier multivariate pattern analyses, then you don't want to necessarily perform spatial smoothing because you would destroy some of those interesting patterns. And finally, we'd want to convert this to a percent signal change. The reason for that is that it's the percent signal change that's directly related to the changes in the relaxation rate. We generally want to do that after smoothing, um, particularly if the smoothing is not performed in the mask. Um, and the reason for that also is we want to generally mask out non-brain areas because uh, if we're converting to percent signal change, things outside the brain are fairly close to zero in signal, and that means the percent signal change would get quite large and, and will blow up. So these are some of the common pre-processing steps that are applied. The next lecture will go into the analysis of how to detect the activation.